success stories do not just uh, happen overnight. Uh, there is an intention behind it, and then there is a lot of work, and there is also a clear idea of what to prioritize. Episode 173. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week we are speaking to Veronica Baraldi. Now, Veronica, I had the great pleasure of meeting when I was traveling in Lisbon a few weeks ago, and Veronica has got an incredible, incredibly interesting career. She's an architect. She's worked uh, for many practices in both Italy and in Holland, including UN Studio, where she was there for quite a a long time. She relocated to Portugal where her husband is from um, and hence that she's now based in, in Lisbon. And there her career took a very interesting turn where she wasn't working as an architect but migrated into the world of consultancy and her background in UN studio was always one of operations and organization and management and this slowly began to grow into a consulting service specifically for architects so she works with operating systems for architecture firms she helps clients design and build their ideal organization in terms of efficiency, effectiveness, and effort. And in this conversation, we talk about the fundamentals for getting organized in a business, the power of clarity in communicating your vision and mission to your team, and also new working models for architecture practices. So new hierarchies, new technologies, and new ways that architecture businesses can become more operationally efficient, effective, and have globally spread networks. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Veronica Baraldi. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Veronica, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm really, I'm really glad to be part of this podcast. Absolute pleasure. Now, you and I sat down and enjoyed a wonderful drink a few, uh, a month and a half ago now in beautiful Already. Lisbon. Yeah. I know. We sat in a park enjoying the wonderful Lisboa in atmosphere and we're discussing about architecture and business and it was a really really interesting conversation um and you yourself you've had a, a background in architecture you are an architect you were working at the um, un studio as yeah. was your husband who was was yeah. he a, one of the partners there he was an associate director associate director so he was an associate director director and then you guys relocated from holland and and um ended up in Portugal. You're originally, you're Italian? I'm Italian. I'm, uh, I was born in Roma, uh, and, uh, but I've been moving around Europe uh, for, yeah. for a while. So um, I studied actually in Venice, uh, which at the time was one of the best universities in Italy. And it was just an amazing experience to live <laughs> there yeah. for a few years. Uh, it was really, it, it was a dream and it's a place I still try to go back uh, as many times as I can. And then I didn't manage to um, go into the Erasmus, as uh, mm -hmm. most part of my friends. Uh, but I mean, we are talking about the um, uh, early, uh, yeah, it was 2000, 1999, 2000. And it was really the time where Dutch architecture was at its best uh, and it the OMA and VRDV and uh, UN Studio mm -hmm. and uh, I was completely in love with Dutch uh, architecture and with Dutch approach to design. Yeah. Uh, it's, it was when uh, 
diagrams were starting uh, emerging and being published and uh, were really the, 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 the tool to understand the uh, um, uh, design request and then to, to start the design and I was really fascinated by it. So I said, okay, I, I will not make it with the Erasmus, but I'm going to work there. And so therefore, af just after I uh, graduated, I moved to the Netherlands where I lived for three years, more or less, and I worked at uh, Case Christiansen and the Architect in C, mm -hmm. which were two offices rather very, very interesting, one dealing with urban planning, the other with the housing, mostly. Uh, and uh, then I decided to go back to Italy, my home country. I worked in Italy for five years, uh, moved and changed different uh, practices and offices, and then was not really satisfied. I had the chance to go to Paris, so I lived for... I think it was nearly a year in Paris. Very it nice. It was a very crazy experience. Uh, I worked uh, with uh, Philip Stark for, I mean, for, for a project there. And it was exactly a really crazy experience, but it was Paris, so everything was okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, then I, uh, and then I was called back to the Netherlands because there was a UN studio. Um, I had a few friends working at UN studio, and they had an amazing project. Uh, it's still ongoing as much as I know. Never built, but still ongoing in Genova, wow. in the north of Italy, uh, which it's a city that I loved and I loved the design. And um, uh, then I went back to the Netherlands. And so I started working at UN Studio, where I stayed for eight years. Wow. Uh, so uh, altogether, 10, 11 years in the Netherlands, uh, uh, some time in Paris, uh, a few more years in Italy. Uh, and uh, in Amsterdam, I met my, my husband, who's Portuguese. And together, we were starting a family. And we figured out that we wanted to relocate. Uh, and, yeah. so, um, and so here I am in Lisbon. And now it's uh, seven years. Uh, I'm here in Lisbon, and it's nearly seven years. Uh, I started my, um, my consultancy in Organization and management for architecture. Um, it was um, it was a bit. I mean, it was a challenge, uh, a funny challenge for me. Uh, when I moved here, I realized uh, I. Uh, well, I was in a different phase of my life, of course, uh, with uh, two young kids, uh, and also, uh, and I want to be really honest about it, uh, the Portuguese market would not allow somebody with my experience to find uh, a job position uh, mm -hmm. with my experience and, and with my expertise. And therefore, I figured out, okay, what am I going to do with uh, I love architecture. This is what I love to do. But what I love to yeah. do exactly. And having worked in different practices and in different countries and environments, I realized that everywhere, everywhere I, I'd, I'd work, I was always the one uh, making things work, yeah. organizing organizing the server, organizing the files, the layers. Uh, there was a point in my career where I was called the layer police because I was the <laughs> one <laughs> checking that everything I'm really, I mean, everything was really done perfectly. So not to have uh, problems mm -hmm. at the end of a, of a deadline or some um, this kind of uh, situations we know very well. So, um, and this is actually something I love. I love to work in an efficient and in an effective way, mm -hmm. mainly because I love to do a lot of other things. Uh, and therefore, uh, I, I, I really uh, focus on my time being efficient because I don't want I don't want to, I never wanted to work long hours in the office or mm -hmm. weekends. And I know it can be possible because I had the experience, especially um, thanks to the Dutch experience, that you can um, uh, work beautifully and have fantastic designs and, uh, um, uh, and beautiful experiences with your clients uh, and make it in time with a human mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, in, with a, a sustainable way, uh, a sustainable way of living, and therefore so, this is how I uh, focused on my new career. Got it. Um, so, so was there something particularly unique? Would you say about UN Studio or any of the other businesses that you were that you were working in or had experience in that made them able to compete or to be operating at that kind of higher tier in the industry? Um, certainly in terms of their organization or management, or were they as disorganized as 
a lot of other architect practices. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> at all. I have to say, I mean, the best experiences I had were in practices that at a certain moment realized that organization was key to have mm -hmm. the projects that they wanted, the clients that they wanted, and the kind of culture, uh, office culture that they wanted. And so um, really uh, worked hard to make it happen. Uh, this is something that I often uh, talk about in my, um, in my work as a consultant, uh, the fact that success stories do not just uh, happen overnight. Uh, there is an intention behind it, and then there is a lot of work, and there is also a clear idea of what to prioritize. And uh, one of the examples I usually talk about is uh, big. Uh, I'm, I'm a great, um, I, uh, I read all the stories behind uh, Big's uh, CEO, Sheila Sogard, because it's not Bjarke Ingels, it's uh, Sheila Sogard, the CEO of Big, and how she entered the company and managed to make it work. And she's not an architect, uh, she's a, um, a business manager, and she really focused on what she knew best, so the finances and the operations, and really providing a structure for the architects to work, to design, without uh, distractions. So without the distraction of everything else mm. that it's uh, um, that it's uh, that it's needed to really build a sustainable company. So um, UN Studio was one of the best companies I worked in, uh, and uh, um, I really learned a lot. Uh, I I have to say I found my place uh, in in such a um, easy way because I'm exactly I'm an organization freak. I've always been very organized, <laughs> and in um, uh, some of my experiences, it was not that uh, uh, it was not the characteristics my colleagues would really um, uh, like it that much but uh, uh, when I moved to UN Studio I realized that this kind of uh, let's say uh, uh, skill I had was really appreciated because it was really clear that you had the great design and you had the great research and uh, the innovation and uh, but you had to realize it and to realize it you have to make it work and so you need organization, structure, and somebody that takes care of everything else. This is not the design, the pure design, to actually make the idea happen. And uh, um, that was an incredible experience for me. Well, where would you say the majority of architecture practices or many of the architecture practices that you've, you've encountered struggle with their organization? Is there specific areas inside of the business that often get pretty chaotic and cause a lot of operational inefficiencies? Uh, I would say the, I would say the main um, issue I always encounter is that uh, there is no knowledge, no awareness of the practice being a company. It's a business. And once you frame it as a business, business of architecture, <laughs> once you frame it as a business, there are all sorts of different uh, issues that you have to take care of. Uh, usually it's only design driven and that it's uh, limiting the possibilities and opportunities that actually a practice is, uh, uh, might have. Um, once it's clear that it's a business and so you really have to work on, on other issues apart from the designs, um, I would say uh, there's um, well, there, uh, let's just let's just look at that for a moment yeah. because that's really interesting, mm -hmm. and it's and it's kind of the elusive obvious, if you yeah. like. It's so it's so obvious that actually we might miss it. Um, what kind of process do you go through with a business to make them recognize that it's a business? And 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 again, I know I know that sounds silly, um, but I've had similar sorts of experience mm -hmm. that actually there's a bit of a paradigm shift where. The business aspects of it get put to the side. It's not something that we're interested. In. We're not trained in it. Yeah, we're not trained. To, we're not yeah. trained to think about organizing design as a business. We're trained to think about it as designers, and design comes first, and we all bow down to mm -hmm. the project and the design. Um, so, so that kind of subtle shift of recognizing it's it's a business. What what kind of conversations take place between you and the and the the, the owners, for example? Um, I let, uh, I'm a very pragmatic person, I'm an organization mm -hmm. freak, so I have to be, uh, therefore what I do is really looking at data. 
I ask them to register data, uh, the amount of time they work, um, what they've been, uh, I mean, uh, whatever kind of uh, um, expenses that they have, uh, how they invest their money, how much money they make. So I really have a first phase of analysis where uh, we really gather and data, and then I show them the data in a completely different way, uh, usually uh, really making a very simple ex example of how uh, a design may be um, managed uh, in a more business oriented way and so show them in a very pragmatic way how things can work differently and uh, at that moment when they they have the numbers and 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 they see it really black on white there is a moment of ah <laughs> so here it is uh, that's uh, then of course you have all sort of uh, uh, nuances that come out but i think that um apart from any kind of uh, um, uh, theoretical um uh, chat uh, uh, speech uh, i could have uh, the the data uh, and their dissatisfaction it's uh, the, the main thing i mean there's all mm -hmm. uh, Usually when I start working with my clients, um, they are in a, si in a problematic situation. They have a right. problem, they have an emergency, uh, things are not working, and that's data itself. I mean, trying to understand where this uh, problem comes from, what is this dissatisfaction, what is that it's not working, and try to unravel it, uh, but in a very pragmatic way. That usually mm -hmm. helps helps them to, to understand uh, um, the issues and, of course, showing them a different way to do things. Because I, what you just said before, it's really very important. We don't have the training at universities. We have no, um, no courses about actual business. And we are asked to be a businessman and businesswoman at a certain point mm -hmm. when we have our own practice. Um, one of the things I work most is visibility in a way to show other ways to do things because we are shown we are not really shown how to work and how a practice works at university and we enter um, the business if we are lucky we may have some uh, training and experience in a big office which allows us to see different parts of how it could work otherwise most part of the architects i know uh, they just worked in small uh, companies maybe of two three people so they didn't really have a chance to understand completely the business and then um, for different situations, uh, they open their own practices, maybe because there was a family member or a friend who gave them, them a first project, and then they jump on it without having the, the training or the experience, and they just improvise or just copy what they already saw that already was not efficient to begin with. And they didn't have the chance to see other ways of mm -hmm. doing things. And as architects, we really know that we don't, uh, we don't really talk about it uh, between us. I mean, we have plenty of uh, um, magazines uh, of, uh, about yeah. architecture online and offline with amazing pictures. But the reality of the business and the practice itself, it's never really talked about just recently in the l latest few years with blogs, with podcasts uh, like, like mm -hmm. yours. So um, there is not a lot of chance for us to see all the ways to work. And yeah. uh, so I also work a lot with uh, showing different ways of work. Uh, and different ways to to develop uh, uh, a business. So, so what are some of the organisational errors, if you like, that you'll see in an architecture practice when you first start working with them? What kinds of um, knots have they would they might have got themselves into? Um, there is a, a, a big problem with time management. Okay. There is no awareness about time, about yep. how much time it's necessary to develop the different phases of a process. Uh, and also the, um, um, lack of awareness about priorities. Uh, so 
of course, there everything we talk about is uh, uh, intertwined. Uh, of course, right. so we are talking about time. We are talking about priorities. Of course, how you deal with time depends on how you deal with priorities. But exactly, our main, uh, um, as you said, our main drive is the project. So what we do, we just jump on the project. We start designing. We start experimenting the options without really understanding what is the priority, um, where to focus first. Uh, um, maybe there are a few areas that it's really important to solve first and then the rest will come. Maybe it's not necessary to have 10 options because also the client get confused. Maybe it's better to give a few options, but a few options that we're really convinced about. So when the client starts criticizing on having doubts, we know how to um, um, uh, talk him through and to yeah. convince him. So there's really, um, th there's a general reactive mode instead that proactive mode so uh, instead of okay let's stop a while let's understand what is this project about how many hours can we spend on it uh, which are the crucial priorities we have to solve so that the clients get satisfied but we also have our way and how i mean it's a long the architectural uh, process it's really long so let's choose our first battles <laughs> the ones that are really important and the rest uh, i mean we will have time to to work on it and start building a plan uh, around it. Um, most part of the architects I work with have no idea how they spend their time, how many hours on a project, uh, uh, how many hours for a task, uh, which kind of um, um, which kind of um, collaborators they need, uh, which kind of skills should they have. Um, so it, I would say time and uh, uh, time and priorities are really the main things because it's it's what gets in the way when you are working in a reactive mode and you don't mm -hmm. really take yeah. your time to plan it out. What 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 should be the priority? Do you think, or is, or is it different for every practice? I think it's different for every practice, meaning that every practice has its own identity and mm -hmm. uh, its own priorities. I worked with practices where the priority was. Uh, the client, so how you accompany the client through the process. And they would spend an incredible amount of time in guiding the client, in replying constantly to the client, in, in, um, uh, in really uh, building distrust with the client. Then you have the practices that are much more oriented in, into the design. So yes, the client, but this is an option for us to experiment or to um, focus on something we really care about, uh, whether it's uh, uh, sustainable architecture, materials, or anything else. Then you have the practices where the focus is really uh, the research. Uh, so I would say every practice uh, has its own history, its own values, and therefore its own priorities. And the crucial thing is to build a process around it. Mm -hmm. uh, around their priorities and their values. Because this is also something that I go through usually in my consultancies, which is building mm -hmm. the ideal process. So how you, the practice would love to have the process from the beginning to the end, but really taking care of going through every step from the client onboarding uh, to the, um, the concept design, the preliminary design, I mean, everything really ideally. And every process it's different for every practice. There are practices that really focus on the concept phase. There are practices that go really quick in the concept phase because they know they're they want to work more more on the um, detailed drawings and the construction mm -hmm. drawings because it's the detail, it's the materials that really makes the difference. I mean that every practice it's it's uh, different in this way. What it's not different is that every practice needs a structure and an organization to make to make every little piece work together and have uh, no friction between the different um, yeah. operations. So, so in, in terms when we're looking at the anatomy of, uh, of a well-functioning architecture practice, what do you see stands out from a highly organized practice and the way that perhaps you know, the, the, high, the leadership hierarchy kind of manifests itself versus a practice which is not that? Um, well, you use the, the word, which is leadership. Uh, in my experience, when there is a, um, a leadership who knows what they want, where they want mm -hmm. to go, 
and most of all that they want they 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 are aware that they need to work together with the team uh, I don't like the work hierarchy because I think that today it just doesn't work anymore we cannot uh, really look at the um, vertical hierarchy of the, the the main architect and then everybody just executing <laughs> It's just not uh, sustainable anymore. So I would yeah. say it's really about building a team um, around your values, what you really believe in, what is your vision, what you want to um, what you want to achieve, and really sharing it with everyone at different levels. That really mm. makes the um, that really makes the difference. And. It- when you first start um, consulting with a with a practice, do you often identify like who the leadership is supposed to be and where their kind of vision and mission and values might need to be focused on, or do people normally have that already in place? Uh, not not all the time, uh, because again, they really some of them not really thought. I mean, they. They feel these issues, but they never really took the time and the space to uh, reflect and to build an awareness uh, mm-hmm. around these issues. So um, at the beginning, I really sit down with the leadership, uh, with the people in charge to understand uh, where they are uh, and where they want to be uh, and try to understand also how much they believe in this in this process. Because usually what I do, I mean, if if I'm called in a situation where the leadership is not involved, is saying, I'm not really into this kind of um, uh, processes, so team deal it deal it with it yourself i usually then call myself out because i know it's not really going to work (laughs) it's never going to work if the leadership is not involved because the people will always look um at at the people uh, that should lead them and Mm -hmm. that should give the example and if they are not involved if they don't believe it uh, if they don't think it's necessary it it's going to 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 crumble uh, down uh, at a certain moment um uh, but it's necessary to but exactly not all of them had had I'd never had the chance to sit around the table and really talk about these these issues, really try to understand. And it's a beautiful process actually to go through, mm-hmm. because especially with the uh, um, uh, with, with the architects I've been working with that never had this opportunity to sit uh, uh, at a table with them and go through this kind of analysis. Uh, it, it's beautiful to see that they have it in them. They never really managed to talk it out to share it with the others even with partners maybe of the company and when you see the partners that they actually recognize that they believe in the same values it's like uh, I mean that's uh, that's a bit romantic but it's kind of (laughs) falling in love again you can see you can see there is uh, ah, but we we do belong together we do believe in the same yeah. things we are building these things together and it's an incredible amount of energy uh that, that builds up and can really uh, take them anywhere from that point but, but it's, it's very interesting because you, you're kind of indicating here that uh, you know a lack of organization a lack of being able to track those important metrics you having good timekeeping data and understanding where you're financial and cash position is on a monthly basis not having that that kind of detail kind of leads the be the business to get busier and busier and busier mm-hmm. with stuff that's not so important and all that busyness kind of sits on top of the the real values and the mission of what the business was about in mm-hmm. the first place which can then lead to all these kinds of say like emotional despondency or people losing mm-hmm. their their kind of energy for something that they once loved. I think this is a crucial point of how work is changing in the last few mm. years. We have always been used to see um, work, something very rational, something very logical, and then whatever that is, emotion, that it's more private life, so to say. We are yeah. humans. We bring uh, our brain and we bring our heart in everything that we do. And we are architects, which means that we love what we do. We are in a creative business and we do it because we love it. And that's passion, that's emotion. And nobody would work as an architect 
if they don't love it because it's quite a hell of a job sometimes. So, <laughs> of course, we bring the emotions and any of us uh, and, and, and anybody listening at this moment uh, remembers all the time that they've been frustrated, that, that their expectations have not been met, that they felt uh, uneasy with their colleagues, uh, that uh, they had the problems in finding a way to communicate with their project leaders or with the client. I mean, we are in a phase where hopefully um, we can bring back emotions in the job, in doing the job. And mm -hmm. the businesses that works best are the ones where this, this is already not a duality. This is already something that is uh, uh, being developed uh, uh, um, in a joint way. So you have mm. the values, you have the identity, you have the dream, you have the vision. And of course, you want to make it work. You have to realize it to uh, realize it, to make it work, to make it happen, you need structure and organization. But when you have a structure and organization that is born, that it's based on values and on, on vision, everything is easier. It's not a burden. Mm -hmm. It's not heavy because it's not a structure that you impose on things. It's not Excel sheets to, feed, to fill every day and you get crazy about it you understand why you have to do it because there is mm -hmm. a vision behind it you can take decisions on daily issues because you know where you want to go and that makes it makes everything so much fluid and so so much easier mm. now talking about vision and mission with with architecture practices I, i've noticed when i talk to a lot of practices that sometimes a vision or a mission can be very altruistic in a practice or very um very noble and very much taking care of like the city or contributing to you know making sure that uh, communities have the kind of architecture that they deserve but sometimes that vision serving that vision ends up getting in the way of serving the business if that makes sense i don't know if you've ever ex seen this or uh, uh, or perhaps perhaps could relate where where sometimes we we end up the practice ends up becoming like a charity rather than a business, <laughs> basically is what I, I'm saying. Um, <laughs> I am not. I can see it. Uh, I can see yep. more or less. Uh, I would say um, that's the question about building uh, a realistic vision. Um, right. I've seen a lot of visions and let's say mission statements that were just mm -hmm. uh, nice words that were not mm -hmm. really felt. It was this kind of yeah. things that you read all the time that are kind of uh, generic in a way. Um, so that from, from that point of view, that it's, of course, it's, uh, well, the vision there, it's not clear. It's not really felt. So it's, uh, it's something that you just put on top of things to present yourself. But I'm not sure this is really what you're talking about. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm. I guess I'm. I'm. I'm kind of asking the question: What makes a powerful vision for a business to ensure that it operates well as a business, and it doesn't become something that's kind of really ultra, oh, not altruistic, but I mean, because I, I think that's a very powerful <laughs> thing as well. Um, but sometimes we can get kind of lost in the okay, we're going to be contributing something massive to society, but then, well, the business. We, we, you know, I've, I've, I've seen many businesses who have, have gone in and they've done lots of community-based projects before the business is in a position mm -hmm. to be able to do that pro pro properly. And then it means that the company is not taking the profits that they deserve um, or the business starts to, to, well, that's, to, to suffer. I, I think that's a question of um, first really uh, understanding what, uh, which are your values and your visions and then mm -hmm. building a realistic business plan around it. So it's how you execute right. it, how you execute yes. the vision, how you execute the strategy. And possibly there is a gap between the two. So you have a beautiful vision, but you haven't really translated it into a business plan or a business model or or something on, 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 this, uh, on these lines. And therefore, yes. you... you you don't make it work. Um, you really always constantly have to um, question and to uh, check your business plan and your business model 
uh, if not daily, at least monthly, to really understand how it goes. And of course, it will bring you to make difficult choices. And mm -hmm. there, it's where you see if the vision works, because the uh -huh. vision should help you take in these choices. If you can't, uh, then there is something and it's not really aligned and you have to, and it's necessary to, to check it back. Got it. Where obviously we've just come out of the pandemic, mm -hmm. a lot of architecture businesses have, some of, many have flourished. There's been a massive boom in the residential sector, yeah. certainly in, uh, across the North America. Um, you know, hiring has become one of the most difficult things. I mean, it, certainly here in the UK, mm -hmm. that's been also the case. Have you, have you experienced this with many of your clients in, uh, in Portugal and in Italy, that hiring has become very challenging as a result of kind of residential boom? Mm, and there, yeah. there has been a residential boom, but I wouldn't say that hiring got more difficult because of it. Uh, what I'm experiencing is that hiring became more difficult because younger generation do not recognize themselves in, in the way of work that we architects right. have. So they are not, uh, they, they, they're just not interested anymore in a certain, um, in a certain way of working and contracts mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, working conditions. So I'm experiencing this at the moment. So a lot of work in residential business, uh, but also a difficulty in hiring because um, working conditions are not uh, good at any level. Well, well this, this kind of leads nicely oh. into uh, you know, our, our, our conversation, one of the things that we mm -hmm. were talking about in, in Lisbon was the different kinds of modern opportunities that architecture practices have today to be set mm -hmm. up. And obviously, you can hire abroad, yeah. you can hire people all over the world, you can have a, a global international office, you can work remotely. You know, there are, there are ways and technology mm -hmm. for you not to be on site all the time with the project or to be more you know there to yeah. be more distance from you on a, on, a, on a project but there's also a lot of resistance to that as a new way of 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 working or many architects will find that you know it's really alien it's a really alien <laughs> concept. very much <laughs> no but there's a there's quite some resistance on in every area i mean the pandemic has been sure. quite a uh, an experience sure. for everyone uh, there have been some industries that managed to um, adjust uh, in, a, in an easier way, but also within different industry, you have cases that just don't want to, uh, don't want to hear about the smart working and remote working. They had enough. So again, it's about the leadership. It's about the people that are involved. Um, architecture is behind in a lot of ways, uh, behind uh, all sorts of industries in a lot of ways um, today of course also the way of working is another of the issues that we are facing so industries have been innovating on different kind of levels in the last few decades architecture has been left behind and now with this new revolution it's getting even worse because then then you can really see um, see it moving to uh, slowly, much too slowly for what is happening. Uh, myself, I am very passionate about smart working and remote mm -hmm. working. I think it's an incredible opportunity. It's an incredible resource. I really see it as the future. Um, I've been working remotely um, for a while for my, in my consultancies. I've been also I've been also working remotely as an architect in um, uh, different kind of projects uh, and uh, I really see it as an incredible opportunity, um, mainly because, um, again, somehow we go back to uh, the, the working conditions that we already talked about. It gives really a different kind of flexibility. A flexibility that is more aligned with the kind of life that we have today. Yeah. Um, and uh, that means that the younger generations and the younger talents will just not uh, accept the working conditions that we had uh, until now. And after having 
um, having experienced the pandemic and the smart working will not go back will not go back 12 hours in the office or 10 hours in the office or whatever it is um, and we need we really need to make a jump in this direction uh, but you know I see it really as a whole how can I say it is a sort of uh, ecosystem we are really moving to uh, change our ecosystem and to um, find alignment in all sorts of ways. Uh, when I talk about smart working, and this is something very important to clarify, because I think that um, there are still a lot of confusion about what smart working is. Smart working, it's not about working from home. And it's not about working from the Maldives or something like this. Smart working is about a smarter way of working. That it's not based on the eight hours a day in the office. It's based right. on objectives. And uh, it's based on strategy. And it's based on collaboration and communication. So you may be in the same office. You may be miles apart. Because the crucial issues are what you're there for, which are the objectives, uh, which are the goals, how do we work together, um, how we communicate, uh, those are the uh, issues to uh, put in place. Once these issues are in place, of course, you are in the office, you are somewhere else, it's the same thing, but you have a different way of collaborating, which is not based again on a vertical hi hierarchical um, uh, organization, but it's mm -hmm. in a collaboration. So. Pointing on the collaboration issues, um, I mean, we're not just talking about the big companies. Uh, I know about big companies, uh, like for example, UN Studio is now moving into a hybrid way of working. You have people right. going to work a few days a week, not every day. Um, and I think this is really for the best because you have the uh, opportunity to have your focus time into designing and creating, which is so important for us without distraction without being called by the colleague every two minutes. So this is actually something, it has been proven that in, in certain uh, areas, it, uh, the productivity uh, went up 40%, for example. This is really very important to have these numbers uh, very clear. And so we're not talking only about the big companies. We're also talking about the small company. Um, uh, talking about the ecosystem, um, we have a lot of problems in hiring also because we don't know who we want to hire, which kind of person. We see a CV, can, do, you, do we know how to read a portfolio, how to read a CV so that it really fits our vision, our values? Um, having this kind of ecosystem allows us not to hire the first person that presents their portfolio, but to hire yeah. the person that we need that has that specific skill and that has that specific approach that it's aligned with ours. And that person could also be somewhere else in the world. So it's mm -hmm. really a question of understanding what we need, which kind of company, which kind of people, which kind of team we want to build, and go looking for that kind of talent and that kind of skills. And working yeah. remotely allows us to look for that talent also somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I mean, my... It Please go. It, 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 it's 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 so I mean interesting. When I'm again I'm like like yourself a big advocate for remote working and and I've been discussing it with with many you know uh, con consultants you know, pre pandemic, um, and I, I find it very interesting the the difficulties that practice leaders find with with remote working. And then often I'll get you know some people will say to me, well. There, you you can't. We need to have people on site. We need mm -hmm. to, you know, we've we've tried walk walk arounds with an iPad. We've tried, um, you know, using Spot the dog, mm -hmm. the the kind of um, robotic dog walking around the site or whatever kind of camera mm -hmm. system they've got set up there. And it's not, you know, there's a, there's a there's a a kind of argument for the quality to be retained, but also I, I think it's interesting what you're saying here that. There needs to be some kind of level of a lot of clear organization and understanding what the business needs because a lot of the reason why the studio format works is because if there's a lack of in, lack of organization in many ways you know you can kind of just look go into the office and spout some nonsense <laughs> and then 
Absolutely. It gets done. Absol- <laughs> absolutely. No, that, that's, that's paramount. Uh, when I say exactly, smart working is about working smarter. So it's about collaboration, it's communication. It's exactly, it's about having clarity. Once you have clarity, mm-hmm. it doesn't, it's not important where you work. When clarity means organization. Clarity means uh, communicate the priorities, communicate the goals. Uh, um, having a plan, once you have a plan, it can be followed. So it, this kind of, of um, clarity, of course, needs a certain kind of structure and a certain kind of organization. Yeah. And another thing that is really important, it's the base for smart working, is trust. What I mm-hmm. see in, in the offices that are really going uh, against, uh, that have been really um, uh, discussing uh, with uh, about smart working, is the distrust they have. Um, are, are they really going to work? Are they really going to make the things the way we want to? Are we really? These, for me, are really false problems because the trust you build, you build it with mm-hmm. communication, you build it with showing leadership, with showing your vulnerability, with uh, uh, building a safe space for everyone to make mistakes, to experiment. Once you build the trust, there's really. Um, uh, you really understand how it is not um, uh, efficient even anymore having this kind of um, uh, everybody in the same office for uh, eight, ten hours a day. Uh, it can be, it, it ha- I think it can be useful, it can be interesting to build, uh, um, to build a team, of course, uh, uh, to um, reinforce uh, certain situations, to have the brainstorming, to design together, but not all the time. The most part of the, of the, the people I meet that are completely against uh, smart working and flexibility in general are the people that are not uh, giving themselves the opportunity to trust. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. And yeah, so it's it's really pointing towards you know in order to to have remote working successful, trust is paramount. Trust is built upon good communication, um, and organization and clarity. Yeah. So being able to and with, without any of those, without being organized, without being clear on what the values are and the vision is and where the business is going, then there's not a lot you can communicate with any clarity. Then there's not going to be any trust. Therefore, remote working of is course. very difficult. Also because it's, it means that it's constantly required your uh, presence and your input. Because if you cannot mm-hmm. communicate clearly the values, the goals, um, the vision, people are not autonomous. They cannot make decisions. They cannot really. They will always uh, ask you for the final decision or the final. And then I see a lot of uh, leaders are saying, "Ah, but I, I, I just. Uh, I mean, I can't seem to delegate. Uh, and these people are not autonomous. They cannot do anything by themselves. They cannot do anything by themselves because you are. You haven't told them what you need. What is your goal uh, what your what is your expectation and therefore they are asking for constant validation but once these concepts are clear and there's clarity and communication mm-hmm. uh, things uh, begin to work properly that's, that's that's very very interesting and i guess the other part of this is the you know the the, the, the kind of technology aspect yeah. of it where so many parts of you know the kind of sit down with your with with somebody and mm-hmm. sketch and draw okay you know, doing that on Zoom, on an iPad, it's not going to replace ever sitting down with somebody and actually drawing on a piece of paper. I, I, I appreciate and understand that. However, there are an enormous amount of tools that, you know, that, that we've kind of inherited, if you like, from the tech world where sure. they're well versed in, um, you know, working remotely and having teams spread across the ro- world. And, you know, that's how most startups have to, they have to begin. They have to begin with, Mm-hmm. with low overheads and you know things like slack and sure and microsoft teams and all these you know it, it there's you know as, as there's as long as there's a kind of a multitude of different ways of communicating lots of different nuances start to start to emerge if you like um which kind of begin to recreate the studio environment or um kind of start think, to point towards that i think it's really i mean 
um, I don't know if it's an appropriate example, but uh, um, I'm of a di I'm from a different generation, and I, I, I in my studies it was just uh, pen and paper, and for my final mm -hmm. project I had to learn AutoCAD, and that was quite a jump at the time. I mean, for the whole industry, you were there with these huge tables and designing for hours, and if you made a mistake, it was, uh, and then you have uh, technology coming, and then you have AutoCAD. I think it's just a question of progress that things change. And I think that, for example, the younger generation will have no problem in finding new ways of collaborating and communicating because it's their world. And actually, I, mm -hmm. I myself don't find any issues in uh, there are an incredible amount of technology, of tools, uh, funny tools, um, interesting to work with, um, a sort of a gamification, gamification of the process. I find all of this really interesting it's just a different way of work as it will always be because it's constantly going to change so i just see yeah. it as a different phase it's a different step uh, mm -hmm. and as a, as that um, as with any different new phase a new step um, there are a few things that are uh, let's say we gain on a few things because it gives us a different way of working, of collaborating across countries, for example, or with digital tools that can actually um, initiate different uh, processes and conversations. And then we have to let go of some other things uh, that maybe we liked, but I mean, it's about change. And uh, so I'm not really concerned about uh, um, uh, how this is going to evolve because I'm sure we're going to find a way to make it evolve um, in an interesting way. Uh, it's a transition. And the thing is, I don't think we are going to stop it. It's not yeah. something we can say, okay, no, let's stop it. We, we don't want to use this kind of tools. We are not going to use Slack. We are not going to use... Because it, it's coming. It's coming and it will be... Um, always more present in our lives and so the practices that are really looking for, to the future will have to mm -hmm. adapt but in from this from this point of view i have to say um like when was it like 12 years ago by now or even more 12 14 years ago when working at un studio i was um, just starting there uh, i mean un studio is a huge company uh, with different offices and projects all around the world and we would work with our engineers and the engineers were in canada and we were in amsterdam and the consultants were in dubai and we were working on webex at the time with very basic tools we're talking about 12 years ago and it was working i mean it, it's just a question of uh, um it's just a question about being curious and being open to yeah. change and just experiment i mean there's also yeah. i think uh, uh, what i uh, what i love doing is really experimenting different ways of work having the the kind of mindset of the um uh, of the scientist it's about mm -hmm. let's see how it goes it doesn't work in a couple of weeks okay we can we'll change it this is also a, a new mindset that we really have to um that bring into architecture uh, not to make things yeah. too serious to have it to no we really have to be agile we really have to be quick and we really need to have fun also with all these new tools I love it. I think that's the perfect place to conclude the, the, the conversation there, Veronica. Fantastic. Really, really inspire in, in vision for architecture practice and, and, a, and a really good kind of rallying cry, if you like, for, for practices to become innovative, to really inquire and interrogate how yeah. they're organized, how they're doing business, and to look at the tools and opportunities that we're being presented for, for these new modes of, of working. And as you were saying, you know, getting the organization and the basic mm -hmm. business systems in place and clarity of vision means that we can start to become more flexible and, and adapt. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely with you there. There's going to be a generation, the next generation of young architects will, mm -hmm. this will be so natural to yeah. them to be creating global, globally connected networks. And we're already yeah. seeing it happening of, of, of people that, we're going to get a very in, a new, interesting um, uh, kind of way of 
practicing and and doing architecture. I would um, so Veronica. I would just add just a few things in this in this um, conversation. Uh, I think reverse uh, mentorship is really important in this uh, in mm -hmm. this um, context, meaning that we really have to share more with the younger generation because they can teach also a lot on how to evolve and innovate. Love it. Amazing. And if people want to get in contact with you to go through one of your programs, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, I have my website. is uh, my name, veronicabaraldi.net. Uh, at the moment, it's in Italian and in Portuguese because it's the main um, market I work with. Um, Got but it. of course, uh, I, also worked, uh, um, in, in, I also work in English. So uh, that's um, just a question of getting in contact and have a first chat. Uh, I usually do, um, I work in... Um, I work building uh, a project around my clients, uh, which could be in one session, three, five sessions, or even a whole different kind of process, uh, really tailor-made, uh, on trying to find new ways of working and to work in a more efficient and more sustainable way. And I have a profile, an Instagram profile, but it's only in Italian. It's Architetta Smart. Uh, but, I mean, if, you're, if you want to train your Italian, that's the perfect place I to start. I follow you. It's, it's <laughs> It's, it's great. I've got no idea what you're saying, but I love it. <laughs> exactly. It's a way to learn Italian. It can always be useful. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. I, I pick up the, a, few, a few words. But fantastic. Thank Veronica, you. thank you so much for um, coming on the show this afternoon thank you and sharing for your invitation. Expertise. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Thanks. Look forward to seeing you in Lisbon again yes, soon. Yes, please. See you soon. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.